Well, I, Sheila is, 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 was my first hit record, of course, my first gold record, and it was uh, probably the second song I ever wrote. I wrote it when I was 14. When you were 14? <laughs> right. And I, I, my father had taught me to play the guitar, and I knew three chords on the guitar, so I took those three chords and I used them all in Sheila, <laughs> and I wrote the song. <laughs> and I carried the song around with me, you know, till I graduated from high school, and I recorded it once before it was a hit on a local label in Atlanta, Georgia, on Judd Records, which was owned by Judd Phillips, Sam mm -hmm. Phillips' uh, brother. And uh, it was out on that label and did quite well around the South. It did well enough for me to get a few bookings with my band, uh, which was called The Satins. Called The Satins? Right, Tommy Rowe and The Satins. <clears throat> so, um, and then the record did pretty good. So then there was a guy, uh, Felton Jarvis, who is, of course, is, was, is Elvis Presley's producer these days. Um, he, he heard the song in the South, and he had moved to Nashville. So he got in touch with Bill Lowry, and uh, they wanted me to uh, do a recording, a record session in Nashville. So um, they remembered that song. It, they figured, well, if it could be a hit in Atlanta and some of the Macon, Georgia, and places like that, it can be a national hit. So they wanted to redo the song. So we redid it, and... And of course, it was a number one record, and I really couldn't believe it. I was working at General Electric at the time, and I was uh, soldering wires together. Wait a minute. I was I was working at General Electric. <laughs> I see. And I was um, I really don't know what I did there. All I know is that I soldered wires together. <laughs> they gave me a little piece of paper, and they said put that red wire with that red wire, and so that's what I did. But anyway, I was working there, and um, Bill Lowry called me one day at work and says, "Hey, listen, you know Sheila is going to be a big record." And I says, oh, well, that's great. It really didn't shake me either way, you know. And um, he says, I, I think uh, you maybe you ought to put in your notice and quit your job because uh, you're going to have to go on the road with this. It's going to be a giant record. And well, I, when was I, this when he told you this? This, it was in Billboard. In fact, he said it's in Billboard charts. Well, I didn't know what a Billboard chart was. You know, I, didn't, I could care less, really. <clears throat> and uh, it was, I think the record had been out, you know, a couple of months. And... Uh, I knew it was getting played in Atlanta, and uh, I knew it was, was doing well there, and I was working fraternity parties and this and that, but I had no idea it was a national hit. Now, this was after you had recut it. Right. This, is, right. this uh -huh. is the one that was on ABC Records, the hit. Mm -hmm. So I says, well, you know, I can't really quit my job at General Electric, you know. I mean, I've been here almost a year. I have a little seniority built up. Uh -huh. and, uh, Toss a little money away in their pension plan. I says, you know, I expect to be here for a while. And he says, well, says, uh, what would it take for you to quit? And I says, well, I really don't want to quit my job. And he was just really insistent that I quit and go on the road. He says, well, what if you come by my office this afternoon? I'll give you an advance on on your record and and uh, a five thousand dollar advance. I said, well, five thousand. I couldn't believe it. You know, five thousand dollars <laughs> to me was like a million dollars. Yeah. You know. And I thought he was joking. I said, well, I'll come by. Sure, I'll come by and talk to you about that. And uh, sure enough, I went by, and he gave me a check. And, and I put in my notice at GE. Next thing I knew, I was on the road with my bags and my guitar. <laughs> and uh, I was a singing star all of a sudden. What was the inspiration for the song? Was there a particular person in your there, life, maybe a Sheila, that prompted the song, or what? There was a girl, but her name was Frida, and the song was originally <laughs> written, Sweet Little Frida. And, uh, Somehow, that doesn't have the it, ring to it. It didn't ring well. That's what the producers said. You know, they were looking for a commercial s sound, and, of course, girl names were very popular then f with hit records, you know, and... And uh, Frida didn't quite ring. Nothing against all you Fridas out there. It is a nice name, but it didn't sing well. There was a big uh, following of Eddie Cochran's over there. And boy, they played his, that come on everybody, all, come on everybody, to do 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 summertime blues. And I thought, well, why don't I just take that, com that phrase, come on everybody, that wasn't the name of the song, but that was the catchy part of the song. And I'll just n name my song everybody, you know, and I'll get that same gospel kind of feel that summertime blues has. And uh, so I'll write everybody around that. And that's, that's how it came about. Um, there was a, you know, in America, there was a, a lull in pop music at that period. And that, that's one reason the, the Beatles came on. They filled that vacuum. Well, what was strange was I was trying to do rock and roll like the Beatles were doing and successfully in England, but couldn't get it played here in, in the States. They wanted Susie Darling. They wanted, you know, Frankie Avalon was big, Fabian. They were those kind of slick kind of records, you know. And all the real good rock and roll stuff from the South, you couldn't get played. 
But in England, you could. It was huge over there. So when I got there, I was in hog heaven because it was my cup of tea, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when everybody, I, I wrote that because of the trip to England. And then when it was a hit in America, it proved my... Uh, my theory that the, there was a vacuum there and nobody was doing that old rock and roll, rockabilly music, you know, and all of a sudden it happened. Then the Beatles came along and just showed everybody it, it, there was mm -hmm. definitely a vacuum, you know, because <laughs> they, all they did in the beginning was copy the old 50s rock music. Did you ever put one together in five minutes? Oh, yeah. Sweet Pea was one. It just, Sweet Pea was like I just woke up one morning and it poured out of me, you know, and, uh, it was a snap. I couldn't believe it. And Sweet Pea was actually a demo. It wasn't even a record. I cut Sweet Pea as a demo to present. I was going to send Sweet Pea to uh, the group that had Hang On Sloopy. I can't remember the... The McCoys. The McCoys. I was going to send that song to them for their follow-up to Sloopy, you know. And so I did a demo on it. When I first went out to L.A., I cut a demo at Gary Paxton's little garage studio, and that ended up being the record. And... Uh, it wasn't a very, quality-wise, it wasn't a good record, you know, the quality was really poor on it. But it just had that magic, you know, the, it started out in Florida, the kids were on vacation, and it had that happy feel to it, you know. And really, the re record business, it, it is, if you can capture magic in those grooves, you know, really it doesn't matter how good the recording is sometimes, if that song is there and there's a little feel, a nice feel to it, and magic. In September of 66, after Sweet Pea, you came out with uh, another song much in the same vein, Hooray for Hazel. Can you sing a little bit of that one for us? <laughs> just, just a line or two of that one for us. Hooray for Hazel, she put me down. Boy, you're really asking oh, me to do yeah. something now. <laughs> I'd rather sing the ballads without my music. <laughs> Tell us about Hooray for Hazel, another one of those, uh, I hate to use the word, teeny bopper right. kind of songs, but it was happy, and yeah. it was fun, it was right. bright, it was danceable. What prompted this one? Uh, Hooray for Hazel. Uh, was there a Hazel in your life at the time? No. Or? <laughs> no. Um, Hooray for Hazel was inspired by the, the song uh, Dale Shannon had called Hats Off to Larry. Right. Same kind of title, but it's just... I said, hats off to Larry. You can say that a lot of different ways. You know, you can say hooray for Hazel, too. So uh, I took that. I, I try and get a title when I write, you know, a catchy title. And then I just build a simple little lyric around it, a little love song of some sort. Girl meets boy in a dance, you know, and they try to live happily ever after or whatever. Uh, the thing with hooray for Hazel is that uh, she put me down, you know. I think probably the hardest song was It's Now Winter's Day. You know, I was going to ask about that song because that was kind of a departure for you from the style of Sheila and the Sweet Pea Hooray for Hazel, Dizzy and Heather mm -hmm. Honey and some of these. It's now Winter's Day. We get a lot of requests for that one, yeah. especially uh, during the winter months, obviously. And it's, it has a mystique to it. Yeah. Uh, how long did it take you to write it? What prompted that? Uh, well, the strange thing about Winter's Day is that I wrote it on a California beach. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it wasn't really hot, but I was on the beach and the ocean, and I was, that's when I was a regular on Where the Action Is, the Dick Clark Show, and we were filming a s segment out there on the, at Malibu Beach. And so I was sitting on the bus, and, you know, you'd film, and then you'd sit for six hours, you know, and you'd film a three-minute segment and sit for six hours. So I was on the bus in one of my uh, off periods, off hours, and I started writing Winter's Day, and I got, uh, I got the chorus and uh, a verse of it, and then I took it home, and I worked on it some more, and it, it took me really to finish that song about six months. I changed it a lot. I had it changed several times, you know. And... Um, so then, you know, when I recorded it, it, it surprised me that it did as well as it did. I, I thought it was going to be much bigger, but what happened when we released it, uh, I forgot the exact year and all, I think it was 68, 67, somewhere in there. But it, they had one of the hottest winners on record, you know, and here I've got this <laughs> Christmas song out. I'm thinking, well, if it'll just get cold now, this song has the mood, you know. I've captured that in the recording. It was Christmas 66 for you? 66. Mm -hmm. So... It just turned really warm. It was a big hit in Seattle and up north, all of the eastern states, you know, but down south we couldn't get it on the stations down south because it was what, so hot. Uh, what was the inspiration for writing the song? <clears throat> um, I had been to uh, Big Bear about a week before we were taping a segment at um, Malibu. And uh, 
it was beautiful. You know, it had snow and on the mountains up there a little bit, and it was cold, and it was nice. We had a cabin up there, you know, and I stayed for a week, and um, so being up there is really what inspired it. Can you sing a little bit of it for us? Oh, I'm kind of hoarse this morning. Just if I had my guitar, <clears throat> just give us a little bit of the line. Everyone is warm inside. Their houses in the snow. The mercury is dropping down to minus ten below. Outside it's chilling, but inside it's thrilling. With fireplaces burning and records that keep turning. Hmm. It took you six months time. to write it. Yeah. I changed it a lot, the lyrics, you know. Well, I started Dizzy on that bus tour, uh, Paul Revere and the Raiders, and I had that chorus written. And then it, uh, we came home. I was living in L.A., LA and uh, it laid around there. I tried to finish it and couldn't. And uh, then we went back out on tour again, and that's when I finished it with Freddie. Um, the title, Dizzy, there was an old Jimmy Reed song. Um, I guess you remember Jimmy Reed, the blues singer. He had uh, uh, You Make Me Dizzy. Let's see. No, what was it? Um, you got me dizzy. You got me dizzy. I think was the name of it. And that was another situation where I took a title that had already been, and I just simplified it or made it my way, you know. And I just used dizzy, you know, bang. And I actually said the same thing that he said in his song. You know, he was saying you got me dizzy, which I'm saying, you know, the girl makes me dizzy. The same thing, but I just I simplify it. So that took you uh, roughly how long to write dizzy? Uh, Dizzy was about three months, you know, the times Freddie and I got back and forth on it and all, three or four months it took us. Did you ever get any, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, any, uh, oh, any flack at all from, uh, your producers or whatever record company people about a song that you think is going to be a hit and they say, hey, no, this isn't going to do it? Yeah, all the time. And, and I've been wrong most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um... <laughs> I didn't think Sheila was a hit. I, th I didn't think Sheila would. I thought the B-side was a hit. But I think uh, my situation is that I'm more critical of my, my songs than I am other people's. Because, um, you know, I think when you live with something, especially if you create it, you've lived closer to it than anybody, then you get tired of it faster. And uh, I think that's my situation. I was definitely right on Dizzy. I thought Dizzy was a hit when I finished writing it. Did they agree with you? Uh, no, they didn't. Dizzy took me about four months to really finish. I had I had Dizzy, I had the chorus written to Dizzy, and I couldn't finish it. And then I got with Freddie Weller, and Freddie and I over, we were on a Paul Revere and the Raiders tour, myself and Paul Revere and the Raiders. And Freddie was working with Paul Revere at that time as, his, as their guitar player. So Freddie and I on the bus tour worked on Dizzy, and it took us about uh, three or four months to finish that song. And we changed it several times, and, and uh, I think that's how we came up with that catchy chord progression in the chorus. It's really a tricky song. A, a lot of really super musicians have had a hard time figuring that, those progressions out. Well, Jam Up and Jelly Tight was another situation where I took a title and I wrote the song around the title. Uh, I got that title from my father who used to say, I, I can remember when I was a kid, he used to say that. Jam up and jelly. He'd see a pretty girl, and they'd say, now she's jam up and jelly tight. <laughs> Which, today we say out of sight, you yeah. know. Like, what would you see that girl? She's out of sight. Well, in the old days, you know, when he was a kid, that was their out of sight. <laughs> so, um, I just remember him saying that all the time, and he still uses it today, you know. If, uh, if he likes a record or something, he said, man, that record's jam up, you know. That's a good record. So, I took that saying that he got, or he used there, and... Um, wrote the song around that. Freddie Weller helped me write that one, too. We worked on it together. And Jam Up Jelly Tight came pretty easy. Uh, oh, yeah, one thing I forgot about Jam... The, the way I started the melody on, on Jam Up Jelly Tight, I had that title stuffed away in my brain, you know, for a long time. And I was in Las Vegas, and I was over there with a disc jockey friend of mine from L.A., Scotty Brink. Don Brink is his name. And uh, we were seeing shows and having a good time, kind of t relaxing, you know. And uh, my wife and I were sitting in the lounge there, and the curtains were drawn. There was a band back there rehearsing behind the curtains. And they started um, doing this little riff on the guitar, you know. Well, the riff they were doing is exactly the way Jam Up Jelly Tight starts off. Because that I, I loved what they were doing. I heard that, and I thought, man, that sounds like a good intro for a song, you know. And I just took that what they were doing behind that curtain, and I went to my room right there and put it on my tape machine, 
And then I got home and I started writing Jim up and Jelly Tight to, the, to their riff they were playing back there.